Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I have a delicious discourse from Paramahansa Yogananda in his amazing book, The Second Coming of Christ, The Resurrection of the Christ Within You. So far on the podcast, I have been quite insufficient in covering the amazing teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. My own relationship and affinity to Paramahansa Yogananda reminds me very much of my spiritual path with Neville Goddard. When I first read Neville Goddard, I found it to be too biblical. I rejected it and read other stuff and then came back to it later. For some reason, I had sort of rejected some of Paramahansa's stuff because I was reading his autobiography and he was talking about bilocation and some things and some part of my subconscious had blocked it off. I've seen this particular trend in my own spiritual path a couple of times and I believe that there is a point where your subconscious restricts you from certain materials. I would always try to go with what resonates and it seems like certain teachings come to you at the right time. And I think in the past, if I had read some of Yogananda's amazing teachings, I would not have resonated with it as well as I do now after reading all the Neville Goddard and the Joseph Murphy. The one mistake I've made in my mind in the way that I treat Yogananda's teachings is I treat it separate from Joseph Murphy and Neville Goddard and a lot of the New Thought literature. I believe that was my mistake and I sort of separated it. But Joseph Murphy and Paramahansa Yogananda and Neville Goddard were talking about the same thing. And it really comes together in his book, The Second Coming of Christ. And he goes over Jesus' teachings and the biblical passages, giving his own interpretation. And many times it's fantastic and you learn a lot about the history of different spiritual systems and the application of yoga as well as the application of Christian principles. I love his discussion of good and evil. There are some amazing discourses. The book is made up of 75 discourses. And I thought about reading the entire book as one shot. It's like 775 pages. And I thought it would sort of get lost in the shuffle if we did that because I believe that each discourse is a beautiful lecture in and of itself they can be read out of order each of the discourses are just talking about different teachings from the New Testament and then his own interpretation explaining what it really means and I just love these interpretations one of the most interesting is discourse 7 the role of Satan in God's creation. And I found this to be a good lecture to talk about this subject further. We have talked about the nature of evil previously on the podcast in the episode by U.S. Anderson on evil. In that particular episode, I read a chapter from Three Magic Words on evil, and U.S. Anderson makes the argument that all of evil is an illusion. We've covered evil very interestingly through Joseph Murphy in his episode on the meaning of the devil in the Bible, basically stating that there is no devil or Satan. It is just negative thoughts. We've also covered Neville Goddard's understanding of Satan as just being when you miss the mark or that thing that leads you astray from what you want to do. But evil is obvious in the world that we see around us just watching TV And we can look at our history and see there is some sort of evil or pushback or difference in consciousness. It is discussed in a more slight way in the Law of One material as being the service to self as opposed to the service to others polarity. There is a very good argument to be made that Satan really doesn't even exist in the Bible. It's a complete misunderstanding of the Bible. But I am incredibly interested in Paramahansa's explanation of the role of Satan in God's creation. Here he talks about the nature and origin of evil, why evil has a place in God's plan, the origin of Satan, the creative power that rebelled against God, the conflict in creation between 
Christ consciousness and Satan, and how Satan caused the fall of man from divine consciousness, man's place in the conflict between God's goodness and Satan's temptations. Perceiving the taintless spirit by transcending the dualities of delusion. I'm so excited to finally read some Paramahansa Yogananda, and you should expect to see a lot more of his stuff soon because it's going along perfectly with what we have been learning so far together in our spiritual exploration of reality creation. There's a quote this begins with Satan originated as the natural consequence of God's desireless desire to divide his sea of oneness into waves of finite creation. The adversarial force maintains its realm of influence by the gross obscuration of the true God nature of all created beings. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Luke 4, 1 through 2 and 8. Discourse 7. The role of Satan in God's creation. The consciousness of Jesus, the man who had become Jesus the Christ, was permeated with the omnipresence of the Holy Ghost, one with the sacred vibratory essence of God that upholds all manifestation. The universality of creation became his body in which his little Jesus form lived and moved. To understand exactly what is meant by Jesus being filled with the Holy Ghost, one must scientifically and metaphysically explore superstition with true understanding of the significance as demonstrated by the actions and statements of Jesus. He spoke of the Christ omnipresence in the Holy Ghost when he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without the sight your father. Jesus, as also the divinely realized yogis of India, not only could foretell the actions of people and the distant course of events through telepathic vibrations of thought, but he also could know all happenings within vibratory creation through the feeling of his Christ omnipresence. An ant's consciousness is limited to the sensations of its little body. An elephant's consciousness is extended throughout its massive frame, so that ten people touching ten different parts of its body would awaken simultaneously awareness. Christ consciousness experienced in oneness with the Holy Ghost extends to the boundaries of all vibratory regions. The entirety of vibratory creation is an externalization of spirit. Omnipresent spirit secretes itself in vibratory matter, just as oil is hidden in the olive. When the olive is squeezed, tiny drops of oil appear on its surface. So spirit, as individual souls by a process of evolution, gradually emerges from matter. Spirit expresses itself as beauty and magnetic and chemical power in minerals and gems, as beauty and life in plants, as beauty, life, power, motion, and consciousness in animals, as comprehension and expanding power in man, and again returns to omnipresence in the Superman. Each evolutionary phase thus manifests a fuller measure of spirit. The animal is freed from the inertia of minerals and the fixity of plants to experience with locomotion and sentient consciousness a greater portion of God's creation. Man, by his self-consciousness, additionally comprehends the thoughts of his fellow beings and can project his sensory mind into star-studded space 
at least by the power of imagination. The Superman expands his life energy and consciousness from his body into all space, actually feeling as his own self the presence of all universes in the vast cosmos, as well as every minute atom of the earth. In the Superman, the lost omnipresence of spirit, bound in the soul as individualized spirit, is regained. The Superman attains this ultimate evolutionary state after baptism or immersion in the Holy Ghost cosmic vibration. By advancing from body consciousness through the successive stages of superconsciousness, Christ consciousness, and cosmic consciousness. In the first state attained in the successful attempt of the soul of Jesus to rise above the cosmic nature, induced habit of bodily attachment of incarnations, Jesus the man felt within the limitation of the body the vibratory presence of the Holy Ghost, the intelligent cosmic vibration heard intuitively in the meditative state of inner communion. In this state of metaphysical development, the divine perception of spirit as the Holy Ghost comforter and the power of attraction of God's love and intelligence in the Christ consciousness is experienced as bounded by the body occupying a little speck of vibratory region on the earth. In the second higher state, by immersion of his consciousness in the Holy Ghost vibration with its inherent Christ intelligence, the consciousness of Jesus was transferred from the circumference of the body to the boundary of all finite creation in the vibratory region of manifestation. The sphere of space and time encompassing planetary universes, stars, the Milky Way, and our little solar system family of which the earth is a part, and on which the physical body of Jesus was but a speck. Jesus the man, a tiny particle on the earth, became Jesus the Christ, with his consciousness all pervading in oneness with the Christ consciousness in the Holy Ghost. This state can be cultured externally by experiencing God's love in his reflection as Christ consciousness, which attracts matter and consciousness toward divinity, and then expanding that feeling of unconditional love to one's family, society, nation, all nations, all creatures, and it can be attained by internally expanding the consciousness in meditation on the cosmic sound of Aum transcending semi-subconsciousness, semi-superconsciousness, soul consciousness, semi-Christ consciousness, to the culminative all-embracing Christ consciousness. A Christ-like person loves all beings and actually feels every portion of the earth and vibratory space as the living cells of his own body. Once Lahiri Mahasaya, my preceptor's guru, was teaching from the scriptural Bhagavad Gita to a group of his students in Banaras, while explaining the meaning of Kutastha Chaitanya, the universal Christ or the Krishna consciousness. Suddenly he gasped and cried out, I am drowning in the bodies of many souls off the coast of Japan. The next morning, the disciples read in the newspapers that a ship had foundered near the coast of Japan, resulting in the deaths of a number of persons. The fatal event occurred at exactly the time Lahiri Mahasaya experienced the shipwreck in his omnipresence. So it was with Jesus. He had successfully led his consciousness through the ascending degrees of expanding consciousness to the second Holy Ghost state, the Christ state of omnipresence. This is what is meant by Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, or Christ state, oneness with the presence of God in manifested creation, is the commonality of divine beings who incarnate 
to serve and uplift delusion-entrapped humanity, as it is none else than the Lord himself, as individualized souls who is imprisoned in the multitudinous forms in the created realm fraught with tests and trials, struggle and suffering. So also saviors sent by God choose to share the challenges and woes of those they have come to free, to redescend into a new body and mind necessitates taking on a degree of delusion even for fully liberated masters. The bliss of intimacy with the transcendental God the Father, spirit beyond all workings of delusion, is embraced by Christ's in periods of transcendence in samadhi meditation. But they return therefrom to the realm of manifestation and its circumscribing creative principles that make possible the cosmic drama of interacting delimited forces and forms. The nature of the manifested world is such that a prolonged or constant state of mergence in transcendence would be less than feasible or even possible for one whose work for humankind is carried out in their midst. Rare souls sometimes serve the world by remaining primarily in transcendent meditation, sending forth powerful spiritual vibrations to balance the world's evils. But these souls seclude themselves in remote haunts and seldom or never appear before ordinary men. I've written of one such avatar, Mahavatar Babaji, in Autobiography of a Yogi. Nature herself stands in powerless awe before him. Stumbling man needs not only the silent blessings issuing from these exalted spiritual benefactors, but also familiar examples who live as mortal beings to bolster courage, faith, and desire for God, and to demonstrate the way to redemption. Enter thus the Divine Ones, who choose for their service the milieu of human fracas. There is an exalted state of inner transcendence in oneness with the Absolute, which in yoga is defined as Nirvakalpa Samadhi. The soul remains in conscious realization of its oneness with transcendent God even while the physical and mental instrumentalities of the body engage in normal expression and exacting activities. This is the goal of advancement seen only in supernal beings. It can be experienced for short intervals or by the highly advanced for months at a time, or for even a few years by those who attain what yoga describes as Brahmasthiti, the state of being permanently established in God union. To remain in the world of illusion while experiencing the indescribable bliss of the sole unmanifested reality makes one's hold on the body tenuous indeed. It becomes eventually a difficult proposition just to sustain the atomic cohesiveness of the specious material form and to prevent the soul individuality from dissolving into spirit. So even in the highest states of divine oneness, the outer nature of the God united retains some degree of the individualized consciousness of egoity and delusion just to keep body and soul together. Jesus the man become Jesus the Christ, enacting his special role in God's drama, prepared himself for his culminating three years of ministry, when he would have to face the strongest of foes, delusive evil and ignorance, to bear his mission's foreordained burden, his physical and mental faculties needed to be forged and strengthened in the fires of testing and temptation securing his outer consciousness in the God union of his immutable inner realization. He had to conquer the metaphysical and psychological tests of Satan before he could relinquish all delusion in the third and last state of transcendence in spirit, the complete union of body, Holy Ghost, Christ consciousness, and God the Father perceived as one in spirit. He knew that so long as he was incarnate in Maya's domain, mortal tests born of delusion remain. Although Jesus was already liberated in spirit in his incarnation as Elisha, 
his newly incarnated body and mind as Jesus bore somewhat of the pattern of past experiences, though no longer binding the memory and intimations of his prior limited human consciousness and its earthly desires through the law of habit that attaches the soul to mortal existence, tried to attract his expanded consciousness to earthly consciousness. This is the psychological explanation of the tempting of Jesus' habit of divine consciousness by his past life established mortal habits in order to lure him from the great comforter, the Holy Ghost vibration from which comes all satisfaction being the sum total of all earthly things looked for. The Nature and Origin of Evil Many modern scriptural interpreters, unable to understand why a perfect Christ would acknowledge the existence of Satan and Satan's power to tempt him, have tried to explain away the old concept of a devil by saying it is obsolete and metaphorical. God is the source and essence of all things. They point out, therefore, evil does not exist. How could evil exist in a world created by the deity who is only good? Others say that the good God does not know evil, for if he did, he would surely put an end to it. To see God in everything and to deny the power of evil to influence one's life has its good points. For even if it is conceded that a conscious evil force or Satan does exist, it cannot influence human minds unless they mentally accept it. However, it is quite contradictory to deny the existence and temptations of evil while remaining subject to suffering and succumbing to desires unbefitting the God image within one. If one inhabits a body, he has tacitly acknowledged the duality of the world of matter. Philosophy can play an intricate word game with truth, but that each individual has to deal with in fact is the obstinate mindset of his present state of consciousness. It is better to know the wiles of evil and the ways to combat them than to be caught unaware in blithe denial. Knowledge only, and not assertion without realization, can produce final emancipation. Though it cannot be denied that God is the source of all that exists, and that evil is a part of his creation, it must also be acknowledged that what we call evil is relative. Certainly it is terrible that violence, accidents, and diseases kill billions of people every century, but death itself is necessary to the renewal and progress of life. Also, earth is not meant to be heavenly. If it were, no one would want to leave the comfortable physical body and pleasurable world to go back to God. Misery, in one sense, is man's benefactor because it drives him to seek sorrow transcendence in God. Thus it is hard to fix a boundary line between good and evil, except in a relative sense. To God himself nothing is evil, for nothing can diminish his immortal, eternally perfect bliss. For the myriad beings trapped in the crucible of mortal existence, evil is all too real. And to say that God does not know their suffering as evil would imply that he is a very ignorant God. There are various causes that can be put forth to explain evil occurrences in the world. Some people say that the responsibility for them lies neither with God nor with any objective evil power. They reject as medieval superstition the view that Satan is an actual being, like a dragon who has to be slain by the sword of the conquering knight, and try to explain Satan away by saying that the origin of evil is subjective, arising from psychological factors, from the thoughts and actions of man himself. This can perhaps be granted in the case of heinous acts perpetrated by villainous souls who cause suffering for their fellow beings, but what about the pain of disease, injury, and premature death? According to the view that evil is subjective, even these sufferings result from man's erroneous choices and actions, his lack of harmony with universal laws. In this sense, it is certainly true that evil in man's life is self-engendered. If a man hits a stone wall with his knuckles, the resulting undeniable evil of pain would not be created or willed by the wall but would be the result of his ignorance in striking the naturally unyielding 
hardness of the stones. Likewise, it can be said that God is a stone wall of eternal goodness. His universe subsists on the workings of just and natural laws. Anyone foolish enough to misuse his intelligence to act against that goodness will inexorably produce the evil of pain and suffering, not because of any intent or wish of God, but because of pernicious ways of life colliding with the eternal good principles underlying all things in God. Man possesses the divinely given gift of free choice to tune in with God's goodness, peace, and immortality. Those who use their will contrarily and act out of tune with him, breaking his laws, are bound to suffer from the recoil of their misdeeds according to the law of cause and effect. A little boy endowed with reason may enjoy perfect health and protection under the strict discipline of his mother, but when he grows up he says, Mother, I know I am safe in your care, but I wonder why you fostered my intelligence and gave me the power of free choice if you were always to decide how I am to behave. I want to make my own choices. I will find out for myself what is good or bad for me. The mother replies, Son, it is fitting for you to demand the right to use your free choice. When you were helpless and your reason had not yet budded forth, I nurtured you through the protection of maternal love. Now your eyes of reason are opened. It is time for you to depend upon the guidance of your own judgment. Thus the youth ventures into the world unguarded with only a semi-developed discrimination. He abuses health laws and becomes ill. He chooses wrong company and gets into a fight, resulting in a black eye and a broken leg. It is the Divine Mother who tries to protect each baby through the instinctive love of parents. But there comes a time when the baby grows up and has to protect itself by the exercise of reason. If guided rightly by discrimination, the maturing individual becomes happy. But if reason is misused, then an evil outcome is precipitated. From the foregoing analysis of evil, it would appear that the cause of evil is more subjective than objective, that much of it is due to the ignorance and wrong judgment of man, not to some malicious force in the universe. The power of habits presents an apt example. The consequent evils of physical overindulgence or indiscretion, ill health being held in the grip of temptation, do not arise until man, by an act of erroneous judgment, forgets himself and by repeated transgressions, allows the wrong indulgence to become a habit in the consciousness. All habits, good or bad, control and enslave the mind only after the will has allowed itself to be overcome by repeated good or evil actions, born of good or evil judgment. Why then are some children born with special tendencies of self-control and some with tendencies of weakness? before they had any opportunity to exercise their reason and free choice. Some intellectuals confidently assert that heredity is responsible for good or bad traits in a child. But why would an impartial God endow one child with a good heredity producing a good brain inclined only to good tendencies, and another child with a bad heredity and a dysfunctional brain inclined only to do evil under the compelling influence of evil physiological instincts. An answer is found in the law of reincarnation and its corollary of karma, the cosmic dispenser of justice through the law of cause and effect, which governs the actions of all persons. According to this law, the soul attracts to itself a good or bad heredity and a good or bad mentality according to desires and habits formed in past earth existences, which being unexpurgated are carried forward from the last incarnation into rebirth in one's present life. A person's good or bad judgment of all incarnations working through the law of cause and effect creates good or bad inclinations, and those inclinations attract him rebirth in a family with good or bad hereditary tendencies or beyond the effects of heredity to an environment and life experiences consistent with his karmic propensities. Thus it may be said that evil in man's life arises from his own wrong judgment. While all these facts support the contention that evil is subjective, that man may be accused of misusing his reason and by creating in harmony with God's laws of giving birth to evil, this explanation does not adequately account for every aspect of evil inextricably bound into the myriad manifestations of creation. 
millions of bacteria and virulent, invisible armies of germs move silently about the earth, seeking, like devouring locusts, to destroy the crops of human lives. Numberless diseases infest plants and animals who have no free choice and consequently could not attract these evils due to prenatal bad karma. Why is there death by floods and cataclysms? It does not seem possible that all the millions of people destroyed by floods and famine in China could have suffered due to their past actions in previous lives. Why is there cannibalism in nature? The baby salmon lives on the flesh of its mother. The big fish eats the little fish, then the fisherman finds joy in catching the big fish, deceiving it with hooked food. And the more the fish struggles for life, the more the sportsman enjoys it and says, My, it is a game fish. Who would like to change places with the fish? Why do men murder each other in war? Why do even the thoughts of wrong judgment and emotions of jealousy, revenge, greed, and selfishness arise at all in the human mind? If man is made in the image of God and God is good, then the logical deduction is that man could become nothing else but good. Wars result from industrial and territorial selfishness, from nations fuming with national selfishness and greed for possession. But why are conflicts not avoided by parliamentary discussions? Why was it that the slaying of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand threw the world into furious conflagration, precipitating World War I? Think of Tamerlane, Emperor of India, slaying one million Hindus after his victory. Think of the Aztecs, who used to cut out the hearts of their prisoners of war, hundreds at a time, in front of their idol gods. Think of the burning of witches and martyrs under the zeal of the Christian faith. How did despots such as Hitler gain the power to wreak untold horrors on humanity? And what of the War of the Crusades, fought in the name of Jesus' teachings, which stress only love for one's enemies? Thousands of priests advocated this war and prayed for destruction of their enemy brothers and victory for themselves. Man did not create physical temptation, death-dealing, bacteria, natural cataclysms. From the very beginning, evil existed to delude man and influence his free choice. How easy is it for the majority of people to be tempted materially, to languish spiritually, and do the very things that will hurt themselves? The warfare of animals preying on each other, the battle of opposites and destructive forces in nature, predatory germs, delusions, power to affect wrong judgment in men, infinitely creative temptations to do wrong even against better judgment, distinctly show that there is an objective evil force that tries to destroy the evidential expressions of the infinite good. The delusion wizened mind of man sends forth a boasting hollow challenge to omniscient divinity that if he were the Almighty, he could create a much better world than this. He would banish from this earth devastating diseases and accidents, mental weakness and pernicious emotions which as revengefulness, anger, greed, industrial avarice resulting in depression, natural disasters of earthquakes, floods, droughts, famines, boredom, despair, old age, painful death, all of the ruinous tragedies of life. He would create a world with a joyous struggle free from the pain of travail, an ever newly happy state of mind for all men, sans mental idleness and boredom. He would make the body invulnerable, changeable, according to the commandments of one's will. He would have our bodies tailored in the workshop of materialization and self-rejuvenation. He would create a variety of occupations with a vast scope of activity, all leading to infinite, unending, pleasurable satisfaction. Good citizens would be materialized by will from the ether as God created the first man and woman. All beings would go to heaven and become angels after they had successfully finished their earthly entertainment. Such a world is easy to fancy, for the soul is always whispering to man its native perfection. 
even while the ego engages him in gambling with the enticements of a distorted earthly duality. An ideal existence is not impossible, but it is for a different time and realm reserved for those who have graduated from the learning assignments of earth life. For the ordinary man, in his present stage of evolution, a life without difficulties would be of little value. No lessons of growth would be learned. No transformations of inflexible natures into godly consciousness. No compelling incentives to seek and to know one's maker. Regardless, the time-worn, unresolved conundrum persists. Did evil have its origin in the plan of a good and perfect God? The Lord himself answered prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, invested thee with thy powers and attributes. Thou hast not known me. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. The illumined rishis of India similarly perceived joy, sorrow, birth, death, fear, courage. These diverse states of being spring from me alone as modifications of my nature. I am the source of everything. From me all creation emerges. Spirit alone is perfect. Everything in creation being delimited is imperfect. The very beginning of creation gave rise to the law of duality, light and darkness, good and evil, the law of relativity necessary to divide the one into the many. By the storm of vibration, God's thoughts of multiplicity brought forth the waves of manifestation, his lila or divine play. Spirit's desireless desire to enjoy its bliss as many selves was unnecessary to the complete and perfect spirit, just as a father through no vital necessity may desire the joy in playing with his child. Spirit's desire was therefore an imperfect stirring in the perfect quiescent bliss, a thought vibration to accomplish something when that accomplishment was not necessary. As introduced earlier, Spirit, being the only substance existent, had nothing other than itself with which to create. So in its infinite consciousness, spirit differentiated in thought only between itself and creation evolved from itself. Just as the varied images in a dream assume a semblance of reality in their relative existence as separate thoughts made of the one mind stuff of the dreamer's imagination. In order to give individuality and independence to its thought images, spirit had to employ a cosmic deception, a universal mental magic. Spirit overspread and permeated its creative desire with cosmic delusion, a grand magical measurer described in Hindu scriptures as Maya from the Sanskrit root M A to measure. Delusion divides measures out the undefined infinite into finite forms and forces. The working of cosmic delusion on these individualizations is called avijja, individual illusion or ignorance, which imparts a specious reality to their existence as separate from spirit. Individualized selves possessing the instrumentalities of a human body and mind are gifted with the power of free choice and independent action. Even though God has created the universe out of delusion, he himself is not deluded by it. He knows Maya as not, but a modification of his one consciousness. The colossal dramas of creation and dissolution of planets and galaxies, the birth, growth, and decline of empires and civilizations, the countless miniature plays of individual lives with their subplots of health and sickness, riches and poverty, life and death, all are happening in God as the one dreamer creator, a chimerical perception of change within the eternally changeless. One part of the infinite being ever remains transcendent beyond vibratory dualities. There he is, the inactive absolute, spirit, 
when spirit vibrates its consciousness with thoughts of diversity. It becomes imminent as the omnipresent creator in the finite vibratory realm of infinity. There God is active as the creative vibratory Holy Ghost with its imminent Christ consciousness. Within the creative Holy Ghost intelligence are all the governing laws and principles that manifest, sustain, and dissolve every part and particle of the Lord's universe. The Holy Ghost inherited from Spirit the independence to create and govern within the mandated vast scope of the manifesting powers endowed to it. This creative power which gives birth and nurture to creation is referred to in Hindu scriptures as Maha Prakriti, great nature, the potentials of all becomings. When this power goes forth from Ishvara, God the Father of creation, as intelligent creative cosmic vibration, it takes on a dual nature as Para Prakriti, pure nature, it creates and expresses all good and beauty in harmony with the God-tuned imminent Kutasha Chaitanya, Christ Consciousness. Its divine nature is magnificently expressed in the causal and astral heavenly realms, but as the vibratory power descends into material manifestation, it becomes conjointly a deviant apara prakriti impure nature creating through the circumscriptive laws of gross matter and the uttermost density of delusion. These two aspects of prakriti correspond to the Christian designation of Holy Ghost and Satan. The Holy Ghost in tune with the Christ consciousness creates goodness and beauty and draws all manifestation toward a symbiotic harmony and ultimate oneness with God. Satan, from the Hebrew literally the adversary, pulls outward from God into entanglement with the delusive world of matter, employing the Mayic cosmic delusion to diffuse, confuse, blind, and bind. Thus, Satan is defined as an archangel that fell from heaven, a force fallen from the grace of attunement with the holy creative vibration of God. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Luke 10.18 The divine cosmic vibration with its creative light became a divided force, para and apara prakriti. The satanic or apara aspect asserts its independence and turns from God and the heavenly realms to ply its wiles in the grossest regions of duality, contrast, inversion, oppositional states, and mortality. Because it enshrouds matter and engages man in the most deceptive confusion of Mayic delusion, Jesus referred to this satanic force as a devil, a murderer, and a liar. The devil was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. John 8.44 Satan originated as the natural consequence of God's desireless desire to divide his sea of oneness into waves of finite creation, a power of independent will that would wield the laws of material creation to manifest and sustain its existence. The plan of spirit was that this conscious cosmic delusive force should be endowed with independence in order to use Maya and Avidya to create God-reflecting finite objects out of Holy Ghost cosmic vibratory energy, in harmonious attunement with the Divine Christ intelligence present therein. Perfect gems in minds, perfect flowers, perfect animals, and human soul luminaries residing on perfect planets were thus created, brought forth as material manifestations from the heavenly, astral, and causal realms. That is why, in the Christian Bible, we find the ideal Adam and Eve communing with God so naturally and simply in the abundant Garden of Eden. After a harmonious existence, a perfect expression of form, health habits, and modes of existence on the stage of time without suffering disease, cruel accidents, or painful premature death, all created forms were returned to God. Just as rainbows come and go, or as motion picture forms can be created for entertainment and electrically switched on or off at will, 
so all created things were to exist as pleasant, mutually entertaining pictures on the screen of space and time, and were to resolve into their pure essence in God at the end of their cycle after the drama of that period was perfectly played. Thus originally, all cosmic energy being vibrated by the Holy Ghost and Christ intelligence was flowing Godward, creating perfect images from astral light turned inward to reveal God, the conscious cosmic delusive force with its independent power from God, saw that if the cosmic energy manifestations of the Holy Ghost vibration were to dissolve back into spirit according to the divine plan, then its own separate existence would also cease. Without the holy vibration, there would be neither a reason for nor sustenance of the cosmic delusive force. This thought frightened Satan. The sole purpose of his being to keep these forms in manifestation was threatened, so for his own purpose of self-perpetuation he rebelled against God as an obstreperous general sometimes turns against his king, and started to misuse his cosmic powers. He manipulated the laws and principles of creation under his command to establish patterns of imperfection that would preclude their automatic resolution back into spirit. Satan became as lightning falling from heaven because he turned the light of cosmic energy away from its focus on God and concentrated it on gross matter. The heaven-revealing astral light became the bedimmed physical luminaries of sun, fire, electricity which show only material substances. Scriptural literature of many persuasions employs a pragmatic imagery of personifying the qualities, acts, and motivations of the deity and its hierarchical derivations, inasmuch as the minds of ordinary persons comfortably closed in a cause-effect view of phenomena, do not easily accommodate divine abstracts unless they too are metaphorically cloaked in familiar guise. God must have a cause to create, his desireless desire, and there must be a rationale for the existence and behavior of a fallen archangel who became a devil, deceiving man and opposing God in ways innumerable, Satan's desire to perpetuate his own existence. Therefore, it can be said that except in the absolute sense that everything is made of the one cosmic consciousness of God, there is no evil in the all-perfect God. Evil resides in the adversarial force that maintains its realm of influence by gross obscuration of the true God nature of all created beings. Philosophic sophistry could convincingly make the case that since the duty of Satan as an archangel was to sustain the existence of manifested forms, he fell from heaven just trying to do his job. In whatever way it has been rationalized, Satan's fall started an enduring conflict between the God-tuned Holy Ghost with its imminent Christ intelligence and the matter-bent lover of finite creation, Satan. Satan has conjured an ugly counterpart for every beautiful creation of God in man's body and mind and in nature. God created a wondrous human form to be charged by cosmic energy and to live in a free, unconditioned divine state. But Satan created hunger and the lure of sensory indulgence. For mental power, Satan substituted mental temptation for soul's wisdom. Satan contrived perplexing ignorance for the grandeur of nature. Satan countered with the potentialities of warfare, disease, pestilence, earthquakes, floods, a horde of disasters. God made man immortal to reign on earth as an immortal. Satan's evil bounds man with the consciousness of mortality. Man was to behold the drama of change with a changeless immortal mind, and after seeing change dancing on the stage of changelessness, he was to return to the bosom of eternal blessedness by consciously dematerializing his physical form. If Adam and Eve, the symbolic first beings, had not succumbed to the temptations of Satan, and their descendants had not allowed themselves to be influenced by hereditary ignorance, modern man would not have to experience heart-rending painful deaths through accident and disease. Man being out of tune with God has lost the power of dematerialization given to the original human beings. 
So he lives with the frightening prospect of the movie of life being prematurely cut off before he has finished seeing the whole perfect picture of his changeful life. In the temptation of Adam and Eve, we see that Satan's evil was at work from the earliest period of creation. It was from my Hindu guru, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, that I received my first clear insight into the esoteric essence of the Christian Bible and its enigmatic story of Adam and Eve. I related his explanation in Autobiography of a Yogi and reproduce it in this present context for the edification of the reader. Genesis is deeply symbolic and cannot be grasped by a literal interpretation, he explained. Its tree of life is the human body. The spinal cord is like an upturned tree with man's hair as its roots and afferent and efferent nerves as branches. The tree of the nervous system bears many enjoyable fruits or sensations of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. In these, man may rightfully indulge, but he was forbidden the experience of sex, the apple at the center of the body, in the midst of the garden. The serpent represents the coiled-up spinal energy at the base of the spine that stimulates the sex nerves. Adam is reason, and Eve is feeling. When the emotion or Eve consciousness in any human being is overpowered by the sex impulse, his reason or Adam also succumbs. God created the human species by materializing the bodies of man and woman through the force of his will. He endowed the new species with the power to create children in a similar immaculate or divine manner. Because his manifestation in the individualized soul had hitherto been limited to animals, instinct-bound and lacking the potentialities of full reason, God made the first human bodies, symbolically called Adam and Eve, to these for advantageous upward evolution. He transferred the souls or divine essence of two animals. In Adam or man, reason predominated. In Eve or woman, feeling was ascendant. Thus was expressed the duality or polarity that underlies the phenomenal worlds. Reason and feeling remain in a heaven of cooperative joy so long as the human mind is not tricked by the serpentine energy of animal propensities. The human body was therefore not solely a result of evolution from beasts, but was produced through an act of special creation by God. The animal forms were too crude to express full divinity. Man was uniquely given the potentially omniscient thousand-petaled lotus in the brain, as well as acutely awakened occult centers in the spine. God, or the divine consciousness present within the first created pair, counseled them to enjoy all human sensibilities, with one exception, sex sensations. These were banned, lest humanity enmesh itself in the inferior animal method of propagation. The warning not to revive subconsciously present bestial memories was unheeded. Resuming the way of brute procreation, Adam and Eve fell from the state of heavenly joy natural to the original perfect man. When they knew that they were naked, their consciousness of immortality was lost. Even as God had warned them, they had placed themselves under the physical law by which bodily birth must be followed by bodily death. The knowledge of good and evil promised Eve by the serpent refers to the dualistic and oppositional experiences that mortals under Maya must undergo. Falling into delusion through misuse of his feeling and reason or even Adam consciousness, man relinquishes his right to enter the heavenly garden of divine self-sufficiency. The personal responsibility of every human being is to restore his parents or dual nature to a unified harmony or Eden. When Eden in the state of divine consciousness was lost to the original Adam and Eve, they became intensely identified with the gross physical form and its limitations. They lost their primal innocence in which they could see themselves as souls encased in a wondrous triune body of consciousness, life, force, and atomic radiation. 
God intended man to behold the human body and mind as delusive thought forms that provide the soul with a means to experience the Lord's cosmic drama. Ever since the fall, man has indulged in the ephemeral attractions of bodily pleasures, thereby subjecting himself to countless miseries inherent in body consciousness. Under the influence of Satan, man concentrates on the outward appearances and vicissitudes of life rather than on the underlying immutability. He is thus stricken with the false idea of death as annihilation. The cosmic motion picture of a man's life seen on earth, his birth, experiences, and death, produces the exhilarating consciousness associated with his birth and the sad concept of his ending in death. Satanic ignorance hides from view man's life as he joyously began the descent from God and his exultant return to God as he hews back to him. Satan, by enslaving man's attention to the physical body and senses, makes him forget prenatal and after-death experiences in the superphysical astral realm, and by showing for a time this drama of life, and then lowering the curtain of obscurity has produced a fallacious conception of death. The change called death is only an outward link in the chain of immortality, the continuity of which is surreptitiously hidden from man's view. It is unmetaphysical and erroneous to say that death does not exist, but it is equally untrue to give to it the reality and finality suggested by the delusion. To dismiss the dismal view of the dance macabre, man should learn to behold all permutations as mere wavelets of change appearing and disappearing on the changeless ocean of infinity. As it is possible to watch the slow process of a flower budding, blossoming, and disappearing on a movie screen, so man should behold his life pictured on the screen of his consciousness through the stages from childhood to a full-grown individual, and then his disappearance into God of his own accord. Satan saw that it would all be very simple if the immortal children of God, after beholding a perfect earthly existence with a changeless attitude, would go back again to immortality. So Satan tampered with the showing of this perfect picture of life before it had a chance to be completed in God. Satan's delusive machinations introduced mental and bodily pain and sorrow. These devil-born patterns of evil have disturbed the intended desireless perfect existence of human beings. Dissatisfaction arising from an imperfect, prematurely destroyed picture of life created in man a sense of unfulfillment and the desire to see perfect pictures played out and completed to his satisfaction. Thus, the immortal soul images of God forgot their already perfect immortality. They began to exercise their free will in pursuit of a desire for temporal fulfillment. But desire begets a brood of desires, enticing immortals into a mortal labyrinth of cause and effect, comings and goings, earthly births and deaths. The law of compensation that for every action there is a binding reaction serves as Satan's most effective means of keeping otherwise free souls earthbound. This is the law of action, karma, which imprisons souls in Satan's kingdom of finitude, makes necessary the constantly revolving wheel of reincarnation. The rebellious cosmic delusive force, through karmic consequences of man's wrong actions, and his mundane desires arising from the dissatisfactions of imperfect living slaps back into finite existence again and again those beings who earn only a brief respite between incarnations in the astral realm of life after death. Reincarnation evolved from Satan's attempt to immortalize changeable flesh in order to keep creatures under his subjugation. Flesh being subject to change was not perturbable, but fated to succumb to the ultimate change of the state called death. Immortal souls in bondage to the karmic law of recurrence could not go back to God with their Satan-engendered imperfect desires, so they had to return repeatedly to earth through rebirth in new fleshly forms. 
Satan, like a fisherman, has cast a net of delusion around all mankind and is continually trying to drag man toward the slavery of delusion, death, and finitude. Satan tempts humanity by his baits of greed and promises of pleasure and leads people to destruction and continuous painful reincarnations. He keeps souls like fish in the pond of finitude and spawns in them the consciousness of mortal limitations and desires in order to make them reincarnate on earth again and again. As one desire is fulfilled, Satan insinuates into the consciousness new desires by ingenious temptations lest the soul escape his devilish earthly nets. In a way, Satan provided a means witlessly acting as the tool of God to ultimately free souls from their mortal attachments. Reincarnation assures freedom for it gives immortal souls ample time and opportunities to divest themselves of all false notions of earthly fulfillment and to realize through wisdom their already perfect divine natures. With the expiration of desires and karmic consequences from wrong determinations, they will be liberated. It has to be conceded that Satan is exceedingly clever to be able to captivate immortals with material tawdry after successful mesmerizing them with forgetfulness of their endowment of divine treasure. Satan uses this forgetfulness to hold all created beings in their finite state, identified with the physical body and consequent slavery to material attachment, instinct, and conscious and unconscious desires for finite experiences. Until man regains his lost Eden on earth, he remains in exile, constrained by the law of reincarnation to strive ceaselessly for the outworkings of his human longings. Satan has a subtle strategy for propagating desires, the introduction of the idea of pain, which is purely a mental phenomenon. The original humans had great self-control in a mind that was impersonally non-attached to the body and so did not feel pain when the body was injured. Originally, pain as a part of creation was simply a heightened sense of awareness to protect the fragile physical and mental instrumentalities from injurious clashes with the objects and laws of gross matter. But by increasing man's attachment to the body and ego, and thereby his mental sensitiveness to their complaints, Satan made pain excruciating. Every impingement of discomfort, physical or emotional, great or small, creates a desire for appeasement. Similarly, with the affliction of sorrow imposed by Satan on the phenomenon of death, death was to have been a conscious, happy transition from the changeful body to changeless spirit. That was God's idea of death. Satan so influenced man's consciousness to desire lasting happiness in the physical body that death became a dreaded, painful parting from the mortal form, causing unconsciousness at the time of transition. Because of Satan's delusion, man fails to see the godly event that death was meant to be a promotion, a liberation from toilsome, imperfect earth life to perfect, everlasting freedom in God. Rather, the grief at being forced to depart the material playground engenders a Satan-devised desire to come back. Ultimately, however, Satan defeats his own purpose, for physical pain and sorrow are also prods that at last cause matter-weary souls to seek their preordained freedom in God. Emancipation is hastened by playing the living drama of a perfect life of health, abundance, and wisdom with a detached mental aboveness. Satan-engendered dualities of pain and sorrow are greatly lessened by a strong mind that does not exacerbate suffering by fear or nervous imagination. That is, if one can remove the consciousness of sickness and not fear illness, if it does come, and not crave health while suffering from ill health, this helps one to remember one's own soul, the transcendent self that has never undergone the fluctuations of either sickness or health, but has always been perfect. If one can feel and know that he is a child of God, and as such possesses everything, even as his father God does, whether he be poor or rich, he can be free. If one can believe in his soul omniscience, 
even while endeavoring to add to his little store of knowledge, he can transcend the ignorance of delusion. All dualities belong to the domain of ignorance, fear of sickness and a desire for mortal health, fear of poverty and a desire for opulence, a feeling of inferiority from a lack of knowledge as well as a desire for a great intellect. Of course, if one is stricken with ill health, failure or ignorance, this does not mean he should supinely continue in that state. He should arouse the perfection within him to express outwardly as health, prosperity, and wisdom, but without acknowledging the pain of lack or the fear of failure. Man should know that his struggle for completeness is born of delusion, for he already has all he needs within his inner powerful self. It is only because he mistakenly imagines, while identifying himself with spiritually ignorant mortal company, that he is lacking in these divine endowments, he needs only to realize the everlasting fullness of his soul's treasure house. The ignorant man stubbornly dreams about lack and failure, when he might instead claim his birthright of joy, health, and plenty as a son of the ruler of the universe. He is even now in his transcendent self, living in his perfect kingdom, yet in his mortal consciousness persistently dreaming Satan's evils. God's awakening touch in meditation is the way to be free from pernicious delusions. Divine contact with the perfect fulfillment destroys utterly all seeds of earthly longings and attachments. The soul instantly recalls its inheritance of eternal bliss, which makes a mockery of all desires for exiguous earthly ways. God in his omniscience must surely have anticipated the origin of evil and the outgoing powers of his creative archangel. But even though delusive duality was the only means by which God could organize a cosmic play in order to enjoy himself through his many selves, he assured that no convolution of his design would be outside the embrace of his goodness reflected ubiquitously in the Christ consciousness. This magnetic power of God's love would in time attract all beings back to him through evolution into divine awakening. By an infinite display in nature and the life of man, God's goodness advertises itself to impress man and influence him to turn of his own free will toward the abode of bliss. Satan counteracts in every instance with deceptive, charmingly pleasant contrivances of temporary satisfaction to dupe gullible man into seeking permanent happiness in impermanent materiality. People succumb to Satan's offerings because he puts honey in his evil pleasures. They taste nice in the beginning, but end in dire consequences. The Almighty could annihilate Satan in an instant by divine fiat. He could wholly subjugate the satanic force, Various world scriptures speak of partial disillusions of the earth because of excessive evils. As described in Genesis, much of the earth during Noah's time was devastated by a flood. But God does not illogically use his omnipotence to arbitrarily destroy his self-perpetuating creation, for that would contradict his own laws and the independence of action given by him to Satan, empowering that force to use these principles of manifestation. Since God gave independence to man as well as to Satan, he can free souls only with their permission and cooperation. Satan has created such a delusive attachment to the instrumentality of a physical body that even if God were at this moment to offer liberation to the masses, I dare say not many would be eager to depart this merry playground, to leave behind their accustomed bodily residence with its possessions and sensory opportunities. To most persons, even the concept of an existence in heaven is of a familiarly similar though far more glorious sentient bodily form and habitation. The body-identified sense-oriented are rigidly unconvinced that it is worthwhile to forego known pleasure for the arcane bliss of spirit. So many learning experiences must be undergone before man is ready to use his free will to choose God above all else. 
earth in the meantime is the schoolhouse in which he must pass examinations and how to discriminate and choose between the soul-binding delusive patterns of Satan and the liberating patterns of God. Man rebelliously protests. If God knows that we are suffering, why does he, being almighty and eternally blessed, allow weak mortals to suffer from the temptations and scourge of evil? It should not be assumed that God is enjoying his eternal blessed state in selfish happiness. He is suffering the tragedies of man's existence, delayed evolution on earth, and belated return to paradise through all emancipating wisdom. His compassion is not elsewhere expressed more munificently than in his incarnate sons, divine saviors, through whom his silent voice speaks audibly to man. Jesus, as a manifestation of God, came to speak for God for the eternal kingdom of heaven, upon whose threshold no sorrow can tread. His message of God's love is that permanent happiness can be found only in God. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt. Matthew 6.19 Possessing Christ consciousness, Jesus realized fully the tug of war between the perfect, universally intelligent Holy Ghost vibration manifesting divine goodness and Satan's pull of imperfection toward the evil in finite creation. He exemplified the love of God the Father and that Father's eagerness to alleviate man's suffering and ignorance as God's power flowed through him to heal the maladies of body, mind, and spirit. He represented God's love for erring humanity in acts and sermons of forgiveness and compassion that showed how God is continuously trying to use the superior force of divine love expressed as parental, friendly, filial, and all-surrendering pure conjugal love to coax man to forsake his cooperation with the evil forces of hate, anger, jealousy, lust, and selfishness. And he exhorted those he blessed to repent of their past wrong actions that had caused their suffering. Go and sin no more. Man cannot be held responsible for being tempted. Satan interjected into the perfect makeup of man's sentient being, the potentials for terrible physical enticements that constantly urge him to transgress morally and spiritually. Satan thereby tries to keep human beings deluded by greed, anger, fear, desire, attachment, and ignorance. So God uses the psychological counterparts of self-control, calmness, courage, satisfaction, unattached divine love, and wisdom to bring man to his divine kingdom. Though temptation is Satan's doing, man is responsible for not using his reason and willpower to conquer evil by knowing and following God's laws of happiness. The gauntlet flung at the feet of every man is to face evil, battle it with the armaments of wisdom, and win the victory. The duplexity of Satan as both subjective and objective accounts for the whole of evil manifestations, and objective Satan as an independent adversarial force opposing divinity, explains the origin of evil that cannot be relegated solely to the individual or collective subjective ignorance of man. Satan has to be acknowledged as conjointly the objective evil in nature and as a power that can also work as the wrong subjective consciousness in man. Recognizing the existence of Satan does not negate the conception of one God who alone is the Alpha and Omega in the cosmos. In essence, in reality, there is nothing but spirit, the only substance ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. The evil of delusion exists only in form, not in the essence of the spirit. As long as there is creation, a coalescence of finite phenomena in the infinite substance, formal delusion will produce the consciousness of a conception of imperfection apart from the absolute inimitability. In St. John 1, 10 through 11, it is written, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Spirit, the prime cause and substance of creation, pervades the creation 
it has made, but the world neither perceives nor understands this divine inheritance. Made does not mean created as man builds a house, rather as water transforms itself into ice, so the spirit by the condensing power of will materialized itself by cosmic delusion into a fabulous universe. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That is, having manifested itself as its own creation, that creation did not receive, did not reflect its true spirit essence. The illusory dichotomy falsely defined matter as a substance apart from spirit, whereas nothing exists that is not spirit everlastingly indivisible. Spirit is perceived as the only reality, the sole eternal substance, when one's consciousness enters the deep samadhi experience of divine union with spirit. After attaining this realization, one is then qualified to say assuredly that there is neither a subjective nor objective Satan, but only the blissful spirit. However, while the incarnate soul views its existence as a part of the dualities of creation, there must needs be acknowledgement that God and Satan are facts, even if the latter exists only in a delusive, relative non-reality. If one is dreaming, he cannot deny the resultant dream pain of the collision of his dream head with a dream-conceived wall. While dreaming the delusion of the universe, one cannot say that Satan or evil or pain or disease and matter do not exist. This transcendent overview sets apart one who awakens in cosmic consciousness. His soul rejoices in the repossession of its memory of wisdom. Ah, nothing exists but pure eternal goodness, the one immutable spirit. While Jesus was striving to reach the final state of complete absorption in spirit, enacting the full drama of human consciousness to set a pattern for the world, Satan began to tempt him and try to dissuade him from God through the accumulated memory of subjective and objective evil born of delusive mortal habits of incarnations of short-lived pleasures from contact with finite sensory objects. Jesus did not deny this evil force. His intuitive knowledge recognized this power as a conscious Satan who lured him with the patterns of evil arrayed side by side with the divine patterns of God. Addressing this objectified force, Jesus destroyed its binding effect with the power of wisdom in his command. Get thee behind me, Satan. Which is to say, let delusion be left behind my soul racing toward spirit. It is folly to deny subjective or objective evil while one is still grappling with delusion. The urgent need is to be watched and protected oneself from the destructive patterns of evil everywhere as temptations within and as imperfections and strife in nature. One should never think it is possible to best Satan at his own game. Just when one feels sure of invulnerability, the devil tricks his opponent with some ruse and the challenger loses. It is better not to enter into sport with his temptations. There are plenty of entertaining good games in God's playing fields in which to test one's mettle and prove oneself a worthy winner. One should rally the patterns of the Christ consciousness inspired goodness in one's consciousness and reason. And in the presence of God as the harmony and beauty in all nature, when the consciousness of goodness is strengthened, its light dispels the perilous darkness of Satan's evil influence. This concludes Discourse number 7 from The Second Coming of Christ, The Resurrection of the Christ Within by Paramahansa Yogananda. This is one of my very favorite discussions of evil, of Satan, of creation in reference to the Bible and Jesus. I really enjoyed the way he explained Satan as being the reason that we reincarnate, that it is a part of matter, linking the satanic element to matter and karma and the beauty of God's creation in that we reincarnate over and over. We evolve over time, allowing us to escape this state that's created by Satan. Now, I am aware that We've discussed reincarnation on a variety of different levels on the podcast. Joseph Murphy says it doesn't exist. 
Basically, what Joseph Murphy's trying to say is that we all reincarnate as God. We're all one being all the time. Something that he says repeatedly. Something that Neville Goddard seems to emphasize, yet also saying that we are individualized as we become God. So there are different conceptions of reincarnation. But my higher self and my intuition and inclination tell me that the law of one material is accurate for a number of souls do end up repeating incarnations because of their experiences in one incarnation there is natural cause and effect and desire of some element within the body that moves outside of the body to continue its lessons and to continue in its natural course of cause and effect nature tends to show some sort of reincarnation and i tend to believe that but i'm open to all discussion of it and i really enjoy the way that paramahansa yogananda discusses it teaching about the yogic background behind this an explanation of christ consciousness in the ways it naturally occurs in the evolving meditating being you may have that flash that moment in meditation Maybe it's a moment when you're just going for a walk. Sometimes it can happen for a second or a couple of seconds where you are tuned in to the oneness of everything. You're aware of the tiniest atom and the largest galaxy and you feel one with it and there is simply no way to write about it or explain it or paint it, but it does happen. It has happened to me multiple times and the more that you ascend and start to control your consciousness the longer that you can experience this state there's a natural place where the spirit just simply wants to leave the body because it's in that vibrating state he kind of just says it can happen for a couple of years in discussion of jesus this person that retained this cosmic consciousness as yogananda explains even when you're at that perfect level there is a part of you that retains its egoity and body so that you can continue your mission on the earth there's a part of you that continues its mission we're stuck here or many people are stuck here from the delusions of matter which is natural and he is saying there could be an objective satan and there may be as neville goddard tells us there is no fiction and if there wasn't a satan at the beginning if you believe that thoughts create reality then there certainly is a satan now because everybody's talking about Satan and Satan simply could have been created. Another interesting discussion, unfortunately, we don't have on the channel anymore, is from Dolores Cannon. In one of her books, she documents a QHHT session in which she asks about Satan. There's also the discussion of Lucifer and the Morning Star we could get into in an entirely different podcast that I'm super fascinated by. Make sure to check out the episode on Maldek in reference to Lucifer. But this discussion of Satan says, yeah, it might exist. And you're only going to come into that true realization that the Joseph Murphy's talk about when you've ascended to that highest level of consciousness. But while you're in third density, living this life, you must acknowledge that there is some sort of evil presence that goes beyond just evil events that are happening. There is something, there's this negative working polarity of movement that literally can be seen by looking at the world and the things that we do and can be seen in your own life. So many new drugs, so many new experiences, such incredible pleasures that you can have of the flesh that pull you into incarnation and his explanation of Satan pulling you into incarnation repetitively is an interesting assessment of the idea of Satan. I would love to get your discussion of it and I'm totally fascinated by whatever you have to say. Whenever we've had discussions of these episodes that talk about Satan in the past, there's always a few people that are like, you cannot deny that there is a Satan. And they say, I've encountered demons, I've seen Satan. And I'm not denying anything. I just wish that my parents had introduced me to Paramahansa Yogananda before I had all these ridiculous thoughts and ideas that were given to me as a child about the devil in my life. I remember secretly wanting to sell my soul for something I wanted when I was a kid. Another interesting satanic discussion is the wonderful book by Anne Rice, Memnock the Devil. It 
portrays an understanding of the devil in such a unique way, I can only say you should read that book and check it out. There's so many other cool discussions of this. I can talk about this forever. I love talking with Aaron Tomlinson about this. You can see a great discussion of Satan with Aaron Abke and Aaron Tomlinson in an interview that they did. So I would love to get your interpretations of it. As I exist in this world of confusion, I want to know everything. So what do you think? You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Buy my art at newearth.art. Access these images to help you find true prosperity, large sums of money, true love, radiant health and spiritual enlightenment with unique portals into the new earth. Welcome to the Reality Revolution.